So we're going to pick up our discussion of bones and the skeletal system by going back to microscopic anatomy. So as we talked about, there's two types of bone, compact bone, which is also called lamellar, and I'll show you why in just a minute, or cancellous bone, and spongy bone, which we looked at as being the substance of the diploy in a flat bone. So let's look at compact bone a little bit more closely. So this is a section of a long bone, the compact bone part of a long bone. These lamella here uh, make up the osteon, and an osteon is the functional unit of a bone. So it contains matrix, cells, and a blood and nerve supply. These lamella, which are composed of osteoid and hydroxyapatite, so the organic and the inorganic parts of bone, have collagen fibers that run through them and those collagen fibers run at perpendicular or 90 degree angles to each other so if you twist a bone or give it a little compression or some torque there are hydrogen bonds between these collagen fibers so with the twisting or the torquing force those hydrogen bonds can be broken without breaking the bone itself those hydrogen bonds are called sacrificial bonds, as in they sacrifice themselves for the greater good of the entire organ. These lamella that encircle this canal are called circumferent, oh, sorry, these are the circumferential ones. The ones on the very outside of the bone are also called circumferential lamella, and lamella means layer. In between these osteons, so there's one here, one here, a third one, and a fourth one here, and of course this one, there are these incomplete lamella that are called interstitial lamella. So you'll see there are these canals that run along the longitudinal axis or the length of the bone. These are called herversion canals. So the herversion canals run horizontally Volkmann's canals or perforating canals run laterally through the bone. And in those canals are the blood supply and the nerve supply. So then the question becomes, how do the osteocytes blast and clast that aren't directly around the blood supply get a nutrient supply? And the answer is this. I'm going to blow up this picture a little bit. So the cells in bone sit in these openings or these sort of cavities called lacuna. The lacuna are connected to each other with these canals called canaliculi. The word canal is right in canaliculi. So those form as the bone, as the osteoid part of the bone is starting to mineralize and get hard. And that's, as you can see, evidence of the osteocytes and blasts trying to make sure that they can still communicate with each other. The arrangement of spongy bone is a little bit different. So in spongy bone, there are no osteons. There are, in this case, trabeculi or spicules, layers of bone that run at various angles to each other, and those allow spongy bone to withstand stresses because you can spread the source of stress through those multiple trabeculi at multiple angles. You may crack a trabeculus here and there, but that means that you won't necessarily fracture the entire bone or break the entire bone. So let's look at the components of bone, the chemical components of bone. So we looked at bone in the lamella and the trabeculi. So bone consists of an osteoid portion and an inorganic portion. The osteoid portion contains the bone cells, so the osteo 
osteoblasts, the osteocytes, and the osteoclasts, and it has a ground substance that is somewhat gelatinous, and that contains lots of collagen fibers. And those collagen fibers are what help to give the bone strength and give it a little flexibility, give it some rigidity. So when you looked at the bones that were baked, the baking denatures some of the collagen and the proteoglycans that are in bone. The acid that you saw the bone in and felt that bone in denatures collagen, and that's what makes the bone hyperflexible, right? There's still some collagen left. The, hy the hydroxyapatite part, the ionic bonded part, has been virtually destroyed. So what's left are some collagen fibers, and they're super flexible at that point. The inorganic part of bone is called hydroxyapatite. And hydroxyapatite is primarily calcium phosphate salts. There's some magnesium salts in there as well. And those crystallize around collagen fibers, much like if you made rock candy when you put the string in the sugar mixture, that crystallization is pretty much what happens with uh, hydroxyapatite and calcium um, phosphate ionization. So how does that ionization happen? Well, that's one of those um, kind of mysteries in, in the grand scheme of life. We do know that it appears to take about seven days after there's enough calcium ion and enough phosphate ion within the bone for an osteoblast to release alkaline phosphatase, an enzyme that promotes the ionic bond formation between calcium and phosphorus. The stats that you'll see here, that bone is about 50% as strong as steel when it comes to resisting compression and as strong as steel in resisting tension, that's torquing, is pretty remarkable. We can still see evidence in bones of malnutrition or how a person lived or in forensics, you can look at bones and see if there was any kind of trauma to the bone long after the person has expired. So now we'll look at two ways in which bone forms. We're going to look at endochondral ossification, which uses a hyaline cartilage model made from mesenchyme, and then bone fills in those spaces left when the chondral class destroy that cartilage, and we'll look at intramembranous ossification as well, which occurs intra within a membrane, and that membrane is a dense irregular connective tissue. So we're going to start with endochondral ossification. The endo means within, chondro refers to the cartilage, and ossification is the process of bone formation. So although this diagram says that this process starts at about week 9, it is in week 4 of embryonic development that a hyaline cartilage model is formed from mesenchyme, that embryonic connective tissue that gives rise to all the other connective tissues. So once that mesenchyme becomes vascularized, it forms a perichondrium, a membrane around a certain area in a certain shape that hyaline cartilage is going to fill in. So now we'll pick up here with the events starting at about week eight or nine. Here, first you're going to get a bone collar, and that bone collar forms around a primary ossification center in the diaphysis. So the reasoning here would be, I want to make this shaft part of the bone the part that's going to be super strong and give me a pillar to start from for epiphys epiphysis formation. And in order to make that bony collar, we're going to have to eke out this space where cartilage was, which means the chondrocytes that were there hypertrophy. They get much bigger and then they die off. The area is then cleared out by the chondroclasts, which secrete enzymes that break down cartilage. The area is then filled in with osteo 
blast. So it's important to remember that cartilage doesn't turn into bone. Cartilage makes the mold, dies off, and then bone cells fill in the open space or that model space. Next, we start forming the medullary cavity. So the cartilage again is gonna break down similarly to the way it did before, and then osteoblast will start to come into this area and start making the medullary cavity where we're gonna get invasion of what's called a periosteal bud. And the periosteal bud contains a blood supply and it contains nerves, some lymphatic supply as well to drain excess fluid that may be accumulating. Now this process of bone development and making that medullary cavity, what you've seen in long bones, adult long bones, takes quite a few months. And during that same time period, we get development of secondary ossification centers in the epiphyses. Now you'll notice when you look at the bone that is present at birth, there's hyaline cartilage on the outside of the bone. There's compact bone all the way around the superficial areas of the bone. And in the internal parts of the epiphysis here and here and the diaphysis at the very ends of the diaphysis, we've also developed trabecular bone or spongy bone. And that will keep um, vascularizing and growing red bone marrow in there as well, which comes from reticular tissue. We'll look at the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is an area of constant cartilage growth that's regulated primarily by estrogen and testosterone as far as when it closes and becomes a line. So the area at the bottom of your picture is the diaphysis side. The area where you see the resting zone is the epiphysis side. So closer to the epiphysis, closer to the diaphysis. Closer to the epiphysis is where the cartilage is still growing. And just like it did before when we were making the bony collar and the medullary cavity, those cartilage cells, those chondrocytes, will get bigger, and you can see that here, then they die off, the cartilage matrix is gonna calcify, and osteoblast will come into this area and start secreting bone matrix and collagen fibers, proteoglycans, those parts of the bone matrix. So this process keeps happening, and I'm gonna go back to the other picture, and pushing the epiphyses farther out or farther out until the plate closes and ossifies. At that point, growth and height would be completed. Growth hormone is also pretty instrumental in making sure that these plates stay open long enough as well. There are types of dwarfism in which people lack or don't produce enough growth hormone and you can see that they end up with a shorter than quote unquote normal stature.